Hello, everyone, and welcome to week six of the Leadership Alliance Professional Development Workshop Series. My name is Dr. Thais Bingham Hickman, Associate Director of the Leadership Alliance, and I will be the moderator for today's event. This event is a component of the Leadership Alliance Virtual Professional Development Series. The Leadership Alliance Executive Office and its partners have created this initiative to ensure continuity of skill building, networking, and exposure to graduate programs for students from across the country. Paired with our Wednesday evening workshops, we hope to expose you to a discussion of critical issues, allow you to network with one another and our wonderful doctoral scholars, as well as develop learning approaches and skills for navigating your research careers. This evening, I'm pleased to introduce doctoral scholar, Dr. Antoinette G. Nelson. Dr. Nelson is a 2019-2021 American Association for the Advancement of Science and Technology Policy Fellow in the U.S. Agency for International Development. Within the U.S. Agency for International Development Office of HIV AIDS, she serves as a technical advisor for HIV biomedical prevention technologies, supporting product development and international rollout of novel HIV prevention technologies for women. Previously, Dr. Nelson was a gender and environment technical advisor within the US Agency for International Development Office of Gender Equality and Women's Empowerment, where she supported the integration of gender transformative activities into programming across global climate change, energy, urbanization, fisheries and biodiversity sectors. She also provided oversight for a number of activities and partnerships to increase women's economic empowerment and address gender-based violence in over 30 countries globally. Prior to joining, Dr. Nelson was a congressional intern for the U.S. Senate Budget Committee and the office of Senator Bernie Sanders, where she worked on a wide range of issues, including health, education, and foreign policy. Dr. Nelson completed her Summer Research Early Identification Program Fellowship at John Hopkins University in 2011 and earned her PhD in Biomedical Engineering from Rutgers University in 2018. Her dissertation research focused on the development of safe and cost-effective nanotechnology-based platforms for HIV prevention. Outside of her professional life, she is a STEM mentor and community organizer having spent over 20 years supporting community-based initiatives to provide foreign assistance and disaster relief to the Caribbean and Africa. Dr. Nelson is a first-generation Jamaican-American born and raised in Queens, New York. She is also a proud member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. So thank you, Dr. Nelson, for joining us. And uh, we're excited to have you. Um, we'd like to hear a little bit from Dr. Nelson uh, in terms of her background and research experience. And then I know we have a number of student questions that we will dive into. So with that, uh, Dr. Nelson. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Bingham Hickman um, for the invitation. I'm so happy to be here. Um, and so should I just give a little bit of background, additional background? Yeah, that would be helpful, thank you. Okay, great. So um, as was mentioned, I'm a first generation Jamaican American. Um, my brother and I were the first in our family, like in our, in our immediate family, um, as well as pretty much our entire generation. I was born within the US. Um, so we maintain close ties still to Jamaica. We would go back regularly like every year. Um, when I was in elementary school, we decided that the family was actually going to get up and move back to Jamaica. So I lived there for a little bit, um, for about two years. And then plans changed and we came back to the US and um, continued school here. So I grew up in, I'm not sure if I mentioned, in Far Rockaway, Queens, if anyone is a little bit more familiar with the New York area. So I, um, I went to Brooklyn Tech, Nico High School, which is a specialized high school. Um, and we had, majors. So my major at that time was biomed. So that was a little bit of, um, I guess, like my deeper introduction into the biomedical sciences um, and where that interest was kind of fostered and grew. Um, following 
high school, I went to Stony Brook University. I know I looked through some of the questions that the students sent. They're like, where did you go to college? Where did you go to undergrad? <laughs> and I forgot to mention it in the bio, but I went to Stony Brook University and I majored in biomedical engineering there as well. And um, during the time while I was at Stony Brook, I, I started to get you know, exposure to research and I worked in um, a biomechanics lab. So in that lab, I was looking at, um, so we were doing mainly mouse studies, um, some rat studies and looking at the effects of um, microgravity on the um, fat and bone tissue of these animals. So mimicking what happens to astronauts when they go into space and trying to get a better understanding of how the, you know, the lack of gravity in these environments, how it affected these tissues and then ways that we could help to prevent um, astronauts from experiencing these, these adverse effects. And then some similar, um, similar, similar trends are seen for you know, patients with osteoporosis, people who are on bed rest. So trying to get a better understanding of all of these, these conditions of limited musculoskeletal use, how that um, affects the body and how we can combat them. So during that time, I, I did research, to be honest, like my, you know, I just wanted to get additional experience. I'm about to graduate. I said, you know, let me get some um, further research experience. And I was, um, in our major, we had tracks. And so I was in a tissue engineering and a biomechanics track. And I chose that track initially because I, um, like, I could see bones. So for me, like, I, I had a, a bigger interest. I didn't have so much interest in the, like, like the micro world. So the world that I couldn't see. Um, so my initial interest was like, okay, I can see bones. Maybe I'll try to go and develop um, prosthetics or something along those lines. So I started there um, and I, I enjoyed my lab work but it really wasn't a passion. And I, I eventually fell in love with research the summer before my senior year when I actually did the Leadership Alliance program at Hopkins and in that experience, I was um, I was at what was it the Center for Pulmonary Pulmonary Care, Pulmonary Care and Critical Medicine, something like that. Um, <laughs> and I can't even remember the the center now. But yeah, I was in that center and I was working on nano, like doing nanotechnology work. So we were looking at nanoparticles and thinking about what happens when you inhale these nanoparticles. So in a pulmonary system. Um, what happens to the like, outer lying of the airways. And so thinking about nanotoxicity as like nanotechnology was becoming like a bigger industry. What happens when, you know, we're just walking around in our environment and inhaling these particles. And during that experience, I really fell in love with the world and like science and things that we can't see because I was able to do Western blots and able to do these experiments where I was you know, getting deeper insight into a world that we couldn't see that was actually dictating like the health of our bodies. So that was so interesting to me. And that was when I like, I fell in love with research. I fell in love with thinking about nanotechnology and I started to think more about it in the sense of drug delivery. Like if these little particles could affect our bodies in that kind of way, you know, and harm us, how could we use these particles now to, to do good and to maybe treat conditions and treat diseases. And so that summer, um, and also with like great mentorship from the program, because prior to that, I hadn't even considered, you know, pursuing a PhD. Um, yeah, I decided to, you know, to switch paths a little bit. I was thinking about going to law school actually. And I decided to switch paths and to pursue my PhD. And then I ended up at Rutgers, um, also studying, still in nanotechnology, um, staying within drug delivery and focus on HIV prevention. So following, following my time at Rutgers, I graduated in 2018. Um, while I was in school, we could talk a little bit more about this later, but I was also like very involved on campus um, in different organizations. And um, when I finished, I knew that I wanted to kind of combine my academic training with my personal passions and the work that I'd been doing in the community. And I, I was really intentional about trying to figure out where I wanted my career to go and to do something that I'd be really passionate about um, and that would really make me feel fulfilled and, um, and joyful just getting up every day to go to work. Like that was so important to me because we spend so much time of our, our days and our weeks at work. So I didn't want my job to be something that I just did to fund you know, my life 
outside of work. I wanted it to be integrated uh, where my passion was integrated into work that I did every single day. So um, it took a while, like trying to figure that out. Um, a couple months, just like really talking to people. And I'd already been I like eyeballing the AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellowship program. Um, and then eventually I decided that that really was the route that I would that would fit me best. And I ended up applying and um, starting my time at USAID there. Um, in between that, as I think you mentioned, I'd spent a bit of time on the Hill. So where I was an intern for um, the Senate Budget Committee, which we can talk a little bit about later. But yes, I've been at USAID now, first year doing gender equality work. And then now I'm in our office of HIV AIDS, um, working on HIV prevention technologies and supporting that work specifically for adolescent girls and young women in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, primarily. And then here yeah. I am today talking to you. <laughs> well, welcome back. I know we had you at our career development workshop last year and um, your story was just so interesting and compelling. Um, and I know that you have some experience with community organizing and we had a number of questions from students about that. Um, and they, you know, they want to know how did you become interested in it? And, you know, how, how did you incorporate that into your career? So if you can talk a little bit about that, that'd be great. Yeah, so, so where do I start? It's, it's funny because someone, someone asked me that maybe a year or so ago, like, where did that passion like start? Like, where did you really pick that up? And um, it brought me back to like, a, one of my earliest memories, I was about maybe three years old or so. And so as I mentioned, first generation, um, my mother, she would, so from I was really young, she would organize these events, um, which, you know, as I got older, I would play a different role in this process. Um, but we, we would organize these different service events back in Jamaica. And so, um, you know, we would do different things, like we would maybe partner with a school, partner with like a local medical facility. Um, sometimes we just go into different neighborhoods in like rural parts of the country, and we would provide them with just different, you know, different supplies and materials that might be needed. Um, and so this particular event we were doing, I think it was near Christmas time. So we were bringing like toys and, um, some necessary items would bring up like, you know, little toys and little trinkets and things so that the kids could kind of have fun around the holidays. And um, I remember like, so my job at this time, cause I'm like three. So my job was to take some of the toys and like organize them. Like I had them laid out like our living room floor and I was like organizing and kind of putting them in the little bags and bundling them together. And um, we packed all of this stuff up and we took them down to Jamaica. And I remember like, I just remember the feeling of seeing, you know, other other children and like other adults and people who um, just how appreciative they were for some of the the items that we brought and just us taking our time to do that. And you know, and to be honest, at that time, like you know, some of those like some of those toys were things that like, you know, I I it helped me to realize like my privilege even from that young age. It was like, you know, maybe I wanted like a at that time like a a robotic dog or something that could like bark and chase me around the house or something. And like, you know, and some of those little toys, like I, I might've not appreciated them the same way. And it just really made me reflect like, wow, like, you know, you, you're taking things for granted as well. So even from that little age, I remember feeling like that and then feeling a sense of like responsibility to, you know, to acknowledge, I didn't know it was called privilege at the time, but to acknowledge the privilege that I did have and to try to make a difference and kind of keep that going. Um, so those are, that's, those are like some of my earliest memories in sense of um, community service. And then I think about, so my sense of like activism, you know, like most of us, we, from young, we watch the news, we see things that are going on, issues with police brutality and, and whatever in our own lived experiences, right? And um, like many of you, it, some of the experiences that I'd, I'd gone through didn't sit right with me or things that I had seen. Um, for example, when I was around six or seven years old in my neighborhood, like one of my first interactions, I think, with the, with the police was um, my neighbor was actually like um, shot. He was unarmed and he was shot in front of my home. And so he survived. Um, but I remember that being one of the first kind of interactions and just seeing like, you know, the way the neighborhood was kind of like really disturbed by that and a lot of like protests and my parents like really involved with um, 
with some of like the activities with the police department and trying to get accountability um, for what happened to my neighbor. So those are so many experiences just from very early. And it was like, and I saw, I guess how my family, like my mother and my parents, you know, made sure to like speak up and advocate on behalf of themselves, but even like, you know, for my neighbor who we weren't like super close with them. We actually became really close to them after that incident. Um, but yeah, but just kind of standing up for everyone in the community and, and banding together. So I think some of my interests kind of came from those earlier experiences and then, you know, additional ones throughout life. And I've just always had like that desire to make a difference in my work. And it's come out in, in just different ways. Now, it's, it brings me, you know, joy, a sense of, a sense of purpose and a sense of passion as I move. And I just always try to integrate it and move forward. I hope that answers answer the yeah, question. Okay. Definitely. No, that was very um, insightful and explains kind of how you, you know, took your personal experiences and kind of made them or I guess integrated it into your career in terms of your passion. Um, and so we, we actually have a few questions about, you know, why you chose a career in government um, you know, how difficult was it to get a position within the government? And how, how is a job in government kind of different from a traditional research career? So I know those were a couple of different questions, but if you can just kind of address why you chose to go into government and what kind of tips or um, advice would you have for students who are, are going in that direction as opposed to a traditional research path? Okay. Um, so, and I probably should have um, prefaced this in the beginning. So I always like start off by talks with saying, um, I do not represent the U.S. government. None of my views here <laughs> are um, representing the, you know, U.S. government overall or the agency that I'm affiliated with. All of you know, my comments, thoughts, everything is from my own personal experiences um, and opinions. But yeah, so I did not always know that I wanted to work in government. Um, so I, I mentioned that when I finished graduate school, like I knew that I wanted to do work that I was really passionate about. And, you know, I took a little bit to try to figure out what that meant and where that, where would I, like, where would I really fit um, with my interests and, and my expertise. And so I took about maybe, let me see, I, I graduated in Maine and I took a couple months where I actually did nothing for a little bit. So I took like a little vacation, I traveled a bit. Um, and during that time, I was also doing tons of informational interviews. So I was aware of the AAAS program, but I didn't really understand what science policy was, what that meant. Um, so it, it took me a while to really dig in and to get a better understanding. And so, yeah, I was doing tons of informational interviews with people in the private sector, um, people who worked in different parts of the government, um, whoever I could speak with, people who worked in nonprofit organizations and letting them know my interests. And um, one thing I think to encourage people with is, so when I started, my job now makes complete sense <laughs> based on like my background and my interests and everything. But when I started, I didn't know that like my particular office or my particular position, I did not know that it existed. Um, so even when I finished, it was almost, it was hard to articulate to people what exactly I wanted to do. I would just say like, you know, I know I wanna do something at like an international level where I'm able to, you know, touch communities across the globe. Um, I want to be able to use my background. So I would give them kind of like the, you know, individual um, points that I wanted to have in my dream career. Um, but I had never, I had never really saw all of that together per se. Um, and eventually just like kind of just having faith that I just, I just knew that there was this thing out there. I'm like, it makes sense to me. There must be some way that all of my interests come together um, in, in a career or a job. And I'm just going to keep talking to people till I figure this out. And um, yeah, eventually I found, uh, she was a former fellow at the time who had done her AAAS program um, at USAID. And I learned about USAID, but similar to the question asking like, how do you get to work you know, in, in the government? It was like a black box. It's like, I go on the website, I see USAID, I see the work that they're doing. And it's like, which I actually found the same team that I'm a part of right now. And I was like, this looks like spot on to stuff that I would wanna do, but then there's like, no information on the website to figure out how you would like apply for these positions or how do you how do you get involved and if you don't really know people who work in the government you have no idea where to start 
Um, so I found out that, so I found a fellow who had been, she did her fellowship at USAID. So um, a mutual friend of ours connected us and I was able to start speaking with her. And then she also connected me with some other fellows. So the power of networking is very important and just encourage people to not be scared to reach out to people if they're doing things that you think are interesting or you don't, you know, they're in an area that you don't know much about and you just want to learn more from them. The worst a person can do is ignore you. It doesn't, doesn't really hurt you. Um, you know, and people really aren't that mean <laughs> if you're respectful and you reach out to them. So yeah, I was able to learn just what the kind of work was going on at USAID a little bit deeper. And then also understanding that it's, it's hard, especially fresh out of my PhD program. I didn't really have much, you know, other than my like research, I didn't have much um, like professional work experience um, that would relate to a career in international development. Um, or global health, especially coming from like an engineering background. So for me, for me to be able to get into a position like what I'm in right now without a fellowship would have been really, really difficult. Um, and so I think the positions are, they are there, but I think sometimes you have to be a bit strategic because um, they do take a long time. Um, and also the you know, the government hires in different ways. So like I am not considered an official federal employee. So I am a so I'm a fellow and I'm through a contractor, like through a contract, the institutional contractor, um, which a good percentage of at least our agency, people come in through inter, in, um, institutional contractor positions. And then sometimes they may eventually switch and become official um, federal employees if they're going to stay on long term and as positions become available. So understanding like how the, yeah, how the government is structured and how those different hiring me mechanisms work is very tricky. So it's, it's helpful to try to reach out to people and, and get a deeper understanding. But I always suggest that if you're interested in working in the government, whatever it is, whether it's, um, you know, with Congress, or the executive branch, um, where I am now, to try to get in. If, if you're having difficulty the other way, as I did experience um, going in through fellowships or internships, a lot of times those are great ways to get like your foot in the door. Um, and then to advance. Yeah, and we have some questions about that also um, in terms of one of the students asked, when would you recommend that students apply for an international fellowship or travel abroad in, um, in order to kind of get to that next step? Yeah, um, I mean, as early as you can be trying to get those international experiences are really great. I think one of the challenges with, um, with international development that we're seeing, and especially now as we're having many more talks about um, increasing diversity, right, in different sectors across the board, um, within a USA, this is definitely one of the, the sectors that we really need to see an increase um, in like black and brown students, the students that aren't, aren't typically um, in these kind of careers. Um, one of the challenges is that like I know myself, I'd, I didn't have many opportunities other than like going on family trips. Like I didn't have a, a period of time where I could take like a year when I was younger, like a year and just go travel the world, you know, or go and like do Peace Corps for um, a year or two, which those are a lot of like the traditional routes that people get that international experience and then are able to come in. Um, so if, at, if there are any times that you are able to take advantage of, of um, travel abroad, or fellowships that are available to you that's definitely always going to be beneficial. My, one of the things that I did was, cause like I said, I couldn't, I couldn't necessarily afford like when I was in undergrad to do like study abroad or um, yeah, or anything like that. So when I was in graduate school, I made it like a big deal and a very intentional effort to find opportunities where I could travel and have it, you know, funded by some kind of fellowship or organization. So one of the programs that I was involved with, which I, I'm not sure if they've started it again. They, um, they terminated it, I think in 20, maybe 17, so a few years ago. Um, but it was called the East Asia and Pacific Summer Institutes Fellowship. So that was a program through NSF where um, you can apply as a graduate student and you would be sent to um, a country, I, I did China, um, there was like Japan, um, Australia, Singapore, and a few others of, of different options. And basically you had to create a partnership with a professor in 
at one of these um, at a research institution in one of these um, countries, and you would go to go to the country and um, conduct a like a summer research project where you would be the principal investigator, like the the funding was given to you. Um, but but yeah, so those were like great opportunities to go to another country, and you're there. You're you know you're there with like a, a cohort of you go out to this country. You're each um, in your individual universities and research. Um, labs working on your projects. But yeah, but that was funded by NSF, which was a great opportunity because I was able to tie my research also to what I was doing back home towards my dissertation so I could convince my advisor to let me go. It was just that I was going to be in another place doing, you know, getting to learn some new skills, getting to get some additional data that would go back towards my dissertation work. Um, and another opportunity that I had was um, I did get to go like to Puerto Rico for like a training program, which was also funded by the NIH. Um, and that was through a program that was um, organized through the University of Pittsburgh, the McGee Women's Institute there. Um, and they still have a good opportunity sometimes where they will, they will send students um, for trainings um, through a few different locations. So just a few examples, but I think, especially as a graduate student, there are many opportunities, whether through conferences or programs or fellowships sometimes to get that international experience, I mean, or even, even just experience within the US to the US is a very diverse place as well. And you can pull from those experiences also. Um, but yeah, take advantage of those because you get you get access to that as a student. Like I can't now as, you know, now as I've graduated, I can't apply to any of those programs to go and have someone fund me to go do research and have a great time. <laughs> with my peers um, in another country or another place. So I really encourage people like when you're a graduate student and you know, sometimes there are also those opportunities as undergrad, but I'm not as familiar in that space. Um, but yeah, search for those opportunities at that particular, for the particular place and time where you are. Thank you. Um, and we have a few questions about imposter syndrome. So we had one come in to our Q and A. Um, she indicates that she's a woman of color and she experiences imposter syndrome. Have you dealt with it? And uh, how, you know, how have you been able to overcome it? And then a similar question that came in uh, regarding, you know, being a first generation woman, what advice would you give to Hispanic and first generation students starting a graduate career? So any um, insight or thoughts about how you kind of overcame you know, being the first or dealing with imposter syndrome? Yeah, um, I would, I think my first thought is the fact that you even know what imposter syndrome is, is already like a great place to be starting off, right? So like that helps you to really put things into perspective. Um, I didn't have a clue what imposter syndrome was till sometime in graduate school when I actually learned that it was a thing and like that so many people, um, <laughs> you know, are faced with it. And not even just like, okay, it's a lot of people. It's like almost everyone I know when I really talk to them and we dig in, like everyone is kind of dealing with imposter syndrome um, in some kind of shape or form. Obviously, you know, communities of color and um, women and, you know, of different marginalized groups, like it, it manifests itself in different forms and different intensities. But yeah, it's it's great that you're you're even able to to um to put it in that perspective and know that you know it's not just you; it's a real a real thing. Um, so yes, when I was when I was an undergrad, I definitely was I was the only black person in my major, um, like male or female. We had women because um, biomedical engineering, like you know while engineering tends to be more male dominated, things that have like, you know, biology are a little bit more balanced. So in a sense, at least there were women there um, with me in my program, but yeah, I was the only black person. And so I definitely, definitely dealt with imposter syndrome. Like my, I mean, like my life just like looked, I felt like it looked so different than everyone else that I was like in class with. Um, you know, we had very different like social groups, very different, um, we were involved in different activities outside of school, outside of our classwork. Um, and so I did feel a lot of times like, you know, that that might biomedical engineering may not be the route for me because like my personality doesn't seem like no one else seems to have like my kind of personality in a way. So um, so on top of like, you know, being whatever, being black, being a woman, like whatever, you know, marginalization you're feeling there. Um, one that I when I also 
point out too is like, there's this misconception that in for you to be like a good engineer or a good scientist that you can't have like a good social life or a well-balanced social life. <laughs> and it's almost like frowned upon, like if you, yeah, if you're advanced. So I was also on the dance team. Um, I was on the step team, like in high school, I taught step when I was in, um, in college as well. Um, yeah, I was, I was pretty social. I honestly, I, I, I partied still, you know, <laughs> I still partied on weekends. Um, and yeah, and it was, there definitely is that misconception that like, you have to be all in your books, you know, antisocial, quiet, um, for you to really succeed in, in, in um, like some of these STEM disciplines. And so, yeah, so that was like on top of it. It was like, wow, like I'm, I'm not supposed to be in these rooms. And the way I dealt with it was, um, I mean, some I have like a really strong faith. So I would say like, you know, if I'm here, like I'm just gonna do my absolute best and God will take me the rest of the way. And that's like really the mentality that brought me through a lot of like hard days when I didn't perform as well as I wanted to on an exam or anything. Um, that's what I would just say, do your best and God will handle the rest. And, you know, it, it did work out um, for me. Um, but I also, I you know, having mentors and having like people that you can pull from are so important. And that's, what, you know, it's a challenge when you're the only one and you can't find people necessarily that you can relate to. In my case, I did have, I have um, two like a cousin and a really close friend of the family who were older um, black men who had completed engineering degrees um, before me, who they were, as I mentioned, they were, they were both very social people. They both were like dancers um, like me and I grew up with them. And they, they shared a lot of their experiences with me. They shared when they failed exams, they shared when they'd failed classes and had to retake them. So they, you know, they let me know like it's, it's okay as long as you keep going. Um, and so they shared like their, their hard moments. And so me being able to know that, okay, they didn't just share their highlights and just when they succeeded and that, you know, in the end when they graduated, it was like, oh, it must've been so easy for them. They shared the rough times with me. So when I hit my own rough times, I was like, you know, so-and-so hit their rough patch and they were able to finish and graduate so I can do it. And I'm just gonna hold on to that and use it as my strength to keep going. Um, so that, I think, I always think about them like as they were like really, really great like pictures that I had in my head. Like if they can do it, I can do it. Um, and so if you have, you know, people that you can pull from, I think it's important if you do have mentors, if you do have people that you, um, you know, if, even if they're not exactly um, from your background or exactly in your area, but understanding like if they can do it, I can do it too. Um, those were the ways that I, I was able to deal with it. And then one other thing uh, when I was in graduate school, I had a mentor who, um, he had this phrase, he had like a very like happy-go-lucky personality. Um, and he had this phrase that he used to say, it was like, why do I care? It, it, was, it was very simple, <laughs> but um, say you might go into a meeting and maybe you didn't like answer the question or you're in class, you didn't answer the question the best way. Like you didn't feel like you articulated it in the best way. And like, maybe you leave that meeting and you're like playing that situation over and over in your head. Like, why didn't I, uh, man, they probably think I'm crazy. Like, why didn't, why didn't I answer it in a better way? Um, and you play that over and over in your head. And then one day I realized, I was like, I don't play anyone else's questions over and over in my head. So I'm worried about how, you know, I look to someone else, but I don't ever, I don't, I'm not playing their scenario over. So I highly doubt that they're playing my scenario over. So it's only me driving myself crazy, like thinking about that. Um, and so I always remember his phrase of like, why do I care? It's like, well, even if they were playing my scenario over, like, it really doesn't matter. You're going to forget it tomorrow. And you try again, you learn and you keep moving forward. And everyone is dealing with that same kind of that same kind of um, yeah, imposter syndrome and those same thoughts in their head too. So yeah, I just try to remember that like we're all human, we're all growing, we're not gonna be perfect and we don't have to be perfect, um, but we're gonna do our best and we all bring something unique and amazing um, to the work that we're doing. And so that kind of also goes to the, the advice for first generation students. Um, so related to imposter syndrome, I, used, I would see people in class where maybe they, say it was a calculus class and maybe I hadn't, um, you know, I hadn't experienced um, taking some of those calculus courses or some of that training prior to that course before. So like say in high school, I hadn't done 
calculus before coming to college. And when I'm in calculus now, like I may be having a difficult time and there's some students who are like flying through the material. I'm like, how do they, how are they doing well? Like, is it, you know, do I just not understand or what is it? And sometimes you understand that like, I mean, maybe someone has a different, you know, study, they have different study habits than you do. Study habits are things that you can learn, right? And you can grow and you can become better at. Um, maybe they also had a um, chemist, uh, calculus class before they came there. So they were prepared differently. Um, so once again, that has nothing to do with like your potential or your ability. It's just about like exposure and, you know, where people are getting it from or if they, you know, working in different study groups than you, but just understanding like we all have we all bring different things to the table. We're all capable, um, but sometimes we just have different exposures. And so me not understanding something had nothing to do with, yeah, my ability. Um, and it's just a matter of now needing to put in the extra work to try to understand it or speaking to the student who does understand it and you know building a relationship with them and being able to learn from them as well and realizing that there are things that I can contribute um, to them that they're not aware of. So yeah, I hope that's helpful, but. It's hard been yeah, working with absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I, I have a similar experience. I remember I'm also a first generation uh, graduate, PhD. Um, and I remember, uh, I think it was like the first week or so at NYU, we had like a student orientation for the first years. And I was sitting in this classroom with all of my, with my peers and, um, I just remember I was just sitting there like, I don't belong here. You know, they sounded so smart. They knew, you know, things that I hadn't studied yet. And, you know, I just remember also needing a tutor that first year. I never had a tutor. You know, I was always at the top of my class and really having to ask for help for the first time. And then, you know, as I progressed through the program, those same students that I thought were like, you know, on top of their game and, knew so much more than I did, a few of them ended up dropping out of the program. So sometimes it's all, you have to kind of put it all in perspective. Like, yes, they may, there may be some students that just know more than you just because of, you know, what they've studied in their programs. But at the end of the day, it's really about the effort that you put in and how dedicated and focused you are. So I would just say, you know, keep, keep um, moving and, don't be afraid to ask for help, so. Right, right, I completely agree. And then um, just one quick thought that came to mind. So I think like, so on the other side, and I think this would help me to also shape my perspective there. When I was in like junior high school, right? Like in my neighborhood growing up in New York. Um, so I, like, I was really good in math and I graduated like top of my class or so whatever, like middle school, right? And um, I remember like there was the exam to take to get into high school, like I said, specialized high school, very competitive exam, um, whatever. So I was, I was the only one in my middle school that got accepted. And people would say like, you know, Antuna, you're so smart and, and whatever. But the reality was my, my math, so what they were teaching us in um, math, I'd, I'd mastered what was learned, what they were teaching at the middle school. Like we actually argued with our teacher, we argued with the principal to get like additional, you know, training and they were like no this is it this is the curriculum like we don't teach any more than this so my dad who has a background in chemistry and a background in math he he was like homeschooling me so I would go to school I would learn these things I would hit the cap at the school but then I was going home and he was teaching me stuff that ultimately helped me to be able to get into the the school for high school and so you know people say like yeah you're smart yeah, but I mean I had access to someone at home that maybe a lot of people did not and you know, and none of my friends, you know, that I knew personally, like didn't have like parents who maybe went to college or things like that. And so they didn't have that access at home. And I always, I just always knew that I was like, it's not fair, like, you know, that I was able to, like they wanted to get into the school as well. And, but I had that like extra boost that the school that we were all attending, like a public school wasn't giving us. So just tying back into saying like why I'm, you know, passionate about like getting everyone access to the same things, because yeah, like your exposure really changes your ability to get into, you know, sit in different rooms and to get to different places. And then on the flip side, when you don't really know something that someone else does, once again, not your, you know, it's not about your capability. It's about, you don't know what they're getting at home or what additional um, exposure they're getting that maybe you're not. Absolutely. Um, so we had some questions come in about your experience um, in your current 
in your current role. Um, and some students asked if you could talk a little bit more about your position as a gender and environment technical advisor. Um, how, it, how was that experience and why did you decide to kind of go into that? Yeah, so that experience was very different from my background. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm, you know, biomedical engineer, very like um, technically trained. Um, so I didn't have, and even when I was an undergrad, which is something, you know, that I didn't like about the curriculum, but since like for engineering majors, at least at my university, they removed some of our like additional social science requirements. And then they were like packed with more like physics and more technical um, courses. And so, yes, yeah, so I didn't have a heavy background in um, like gender studies. I, you know, I took like a general like women's studies class or something in undergrad, but yeah, I didn't have much um, exposure more broadly other than, you know, being like a woman, my lived experiences um, and like some of the work that I've done in community with like young girls um, and women in general, but I had no like training there. So when you're in the AAAS fellowship program, you have, um, there are many stages in the process. Um, it's a pretty competitive program. If, if anyone's interested in like science policy, strongly suggest like just taking a, a note about it. Um, there are many different science policy programs, but definitely one of them to look into in the future. Um, but you get to a point in the process where you interview with a lot of different offices um, and different government agencies. So it, it might be good to pause there for a second. So I'm in the executive branch and I didn't understand this before. So I think it just might be good to explain a little bit of the structure. So the executive branch, um, so we know like, okay, that's the president, the vice president and like the cabinet members. And I know for me, that's all I knew. I didn't know much else like, okay, what happens outside of that? But the cabinet members, right, they're all like heads of different departments. Um, so like your state department, your like department of, of education, um, your USDA department of agriculture and so on. Um, and then you have like other, other high level um, political appointees that are like heads of different agencies and like offices. So there are, I think, I think over a hundred of these like agencies, departments, like independent offices that are under like the president's like line of executive branch. Um, so USAID is, is one of those. And so I'm an executive branch fellow, which means when we get to a certain part in the interview process, we're interviewing with, so I interviewed at USAID, I interviewed with other agencies or departments that are like within this line um, that are maybe doing, you know, either other kind of similar work or for whatever reason, they're, in, they're interested in interviewing me or I'm interested in their work. So when I interviewed for, the particular office at USAID that did gender equality work and just hearing more about what they did based on my personal passions um, and what I wanted to get out of like the professional development experience, I ended up saying, okay, you know, I think this would be great. I have, I didn't really have much experience at all, but there were a lot of um, resources that the agency has that to like learn about like gender equality and specifically within the space of like USAID policy. So like what does gender equality and um, women's empowerment, like what are the tools to help um, advance these, um, these areas of equality and, and equity um, within USAID's programming. So there are tools and, and trainings and different resources that I can come into the agency that I would have access to that would help to train me to be able to do that kind of work as well and to just learn. So I am by no shape or form a gender expert um, but I was able to go in there and basically use like, it's a lot of um, like project management work, a lot of um, ability to think critically. So a lot of the transferable skills from my PhD was much, I would say more so used. And then just like for me, I, I wouldn't say common sense, but, but in a sense of like the work that I'd already been doing in advocacy and just like understanding different point, points of views and thinking about people and, um, just think about equality in general, those principles and values just went naturally into the work that I was doing. And so it was pretty easy to integrate that. Um, the work that we did specifically, I was a technical advisor for gender and environment, which meant that environment, um, as uh, you were reading earlier in the bio. So I worked with the offices that dealt with like climate change issues, um, energy, so, um, I'll come back to that. energy, um, fishery sectors, like biodiversity, urbanization. So anything that kind of touches land and environment, climate, 
and whatever. And we would work with the experts and the, the technical specialists within those offices who have their programs that are in those sectors. And we'd make sure that they're thinking about issues of gender equality and thinking about how to integrate specific activities into their work to help advance issues of gender equality. So I'll give you some examples because it's probably hard to like really picture. Um, but one example was there was a, a partnership between um, like USAID and, and NASA, I think that's called like the Surveyor Program. And so that is a longstanding partnership between these two agencies. Um, one aspect of it that the gender office was working on was trying to, um, oh, okay, so take a step back. So Surveyor is focused on um, using like, so like geospatial data. So from the satellites in the sky, they're using this data to see and, and predict like different, um, different environmental changes, different, um, you know, whether, whether there may be floods that may be coming, um, droughts that may be coming. So different environmental changes and things that they could help to um, predict like warn communities for and to help prevent like mitigation strategies. So they use this data for a variety of different things. Um, and so our, the gender office was focused on helping women get access into these, into these, this sector. So this, um, the geospatial sector in general. So there aren't a lot of women. This is, you know, a, a very technical STEM sector. So how do we get women um, across the world? Because there are many different hubs for this program. The Surveyor program is around the world. And how do we get women in these different countries to actually be able to be part of this structure? So, so like the, the activity itself was just about, you know, getting data out there, helping to make these predictions. Um, and then the office, the gender office was thinking more in the sense of, well, when you're disseminating the data that's coming from these technologies, are you disseminating them in ways that women can actually access the information? So for example, if you're in a country where women have like a higher um, illiteracy rate, are you disseminating the data mostly through newspapers or you know, through cell phones where maybe the women may not have access to the cell phones? Like sometimes the, the, male, the men in the family will be the ones that kind of like hold access to the cell phone or certain technologies. Um, so how are we making it that the women are getting equal, you know, equal access to this information and um, just things of that nature. And then additionally, how do we get women to be in this field so that they could help to shape how the information is being disseminated. So on. like, if you put diverse people into these positions, then they will help to help, you know, help the um, institution to be thinking in these different ways as well. So we kind of attacked it from like both angles. Um, so that's just one example. Another example was a, um, an activity in like the energy sector where similarly looking at how do we get women um, access to jobs in utility companies and not just jobs, but how do we get them into leadership positions so that they're growing um, and they can be more um, economically stable and economically empowered um, within these different sectors. Um, but yeah, endless of examples, but those, those were some of the different activities that we worked on. And it's a lot of project management, so working with our partners in the different countries to make sure that we're implementing these programs and that we're really thinking about women like, in every aspect of them. Yeah, that's really interesting. And, and I never really thought about it from that perspective in terms of you know, just the cultures in different countries and the access um, and the biases between between men and women and how you kind of bridge those gaps. Um, so we are almost at time and I want to kind of build upon what you were just talking about. Um, and hopefully, you know, maybe you can end with this, but it is a loaded question here. <laughs> so uh, do your best. But um, one of the students asked, as an Afro-Caribbean woman, what do you believe is left to be done to bring health equity and reliable health information to underserved countries or populations? Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, there's so many ways to, to address that. But I think um, it's kind of similar to what I was talking about um, so say in, in like the gender concept, but it's the same thing for you know communities of color. Um, bringing people into the conversation. So like as it, um, 
you know, as we're, we're doing this work abroad and we're, we're interjecting ourselves into the lives of other people. And, you know, a lot of times this is done with a good heart and good intention, um, but the communities that we are serving and the communities that we are working with ultimately need to be involved in the conversation. And from very early, they're like, their input needs to be respected and valued and it needs to be integrated from early on and throughout the entire process. So like even in the work that we do now um, in the HIV space, that's something that like my team is very like, adamant about pushing for and trying to always be like more strategic and better about um, making sure that we are bringing in advocates, like community advisory boards, um, you know, the individuals that are most directly affected um, by HIV or you know, in, in other sectors, whatever it is that we're specifically dealing with, but making sure that we're bringing the community into the conversation early enough. Um, I think, yeah, there's, there's, there's so many things <laughs> we could talk about with, like you said, it is a, a real loaded question, but I think it really comes from um, first respecting and valuing like the input of the communities that we're bringing and not thinking that like you're doing, we're doing these communities a favor, like, oh, you know, they need us to come and like, educate them on such and such, or they, you know, not valuing what they bring to the table and the expertise in it. And because in some cases, even if it may not be like formal education, in many cases it, it is, but you know, even if it's not like say a formal education, but valuing what, what that input and what that education and what that knowledge is, um, that local, that like community knowledge, that cultural knowledge, um, and how that, yeah, can better shape the work that we are doing. Um, thinking about like in a health, in a, just in the health field in general and global health. Um, yes, yeah, so I think that's probably like the first thing that comes to mind is like really bringing in the community and like doing work in partnership, which is a lot, you know, a lot of times that's not really the case. Like people, decisions are often made elsewhere and brought into the community and, um, or sometimes, you know, input is sought, but it's like really late in the process. And if you seek input really late in the process, there's like a lack of ownership, there's a lack of trust that is there. Um, and it, you know, you're not really getting um, sustainable results. You're not really building the the longevity and the, yeah, the you're not being as successful as you should be. And so that's just, that's something we always try to keep in mind with our work. And I think in general, you know, we can, I think health um, practitioners and global health practitioners can be doing a better job about that. I think a lot of discussion is more common now, especially with, with everything that happened, like say recently George Floyd, and I think like, kind of the awakening that's going on across sectors, at least I'm seeing it a lot in, in um, the work that we're doing, that people are adamantly and actively having these discussions and trying to, you know, talking about what does it mean to decolonize um, global health and international development and how do we be better partners? Um, yeah, and I said, it's, you know, there are a lot of layers to this and there are a lot of factors and politics and things that do come into play, but there are a lot of really strong advocates and a lot of really um, well-meaning and adamant people, you know, in the international development space and the global health space that are always fighting and advocating for, for better partnerships. All right. Well, I think, you know, we will end uh, with that. Um, I know Sam uh, has your contact information and can share it with the students in the Google Classroom because there are a number of questions that we did not get to. Um, but I do want to ask if there's any parting words or any piece of advice, uh, Dr. Nelson, that you want to impart upon our students before we end the conversation. Um. Yeah, well, once again, you know, thanks so much for having me. Um, so this, I think parting advice I would give is to really, um, let me see, like what, what one parting advice? I have so many things. <laughs> um, but yeah, just to really trust your, like to trust your gut, I think as you're making your decisions um, in your career. So. As I, I mentioned earlier that um, my career that I have right now, this is, I'm doing like my dream job. Like this has like everything I could possibly think of in it in one space. And I didn't know it existed, you know, two years ago. 
And when I was trying to figure it out, um, you know, there were people that were like, what are you doing? Like, why don't you know exactly what you're doing yet? Why are you taking time? Like, you should already have this planned out. Um, or yeah, they, they, they just didn't understand why I would want to go the route that I would want to go. And it took a while for me to figure out what worked best for me. And when I did, you know, some of those same people, there are some of them that are actually asking me for advice now, like, well, okay, I want to make a career switch. Like, how, how should I go about it? Um, so just really trusting your gut and like the direction that you're being pulled in, um, knowing that like there really is a place where you can, you know, you may not know it at this point right in, in time, but there's a place where you can really combine your interests in different ways. And um, it may just take a while to look, to like speak to some different people, to do a little bit more research, um, to figure it out. But I just really believe that your career should be something that you are passionate about. Um, um, yeah, that is, for me, it's aligned with my purpose. I believe um, that you wake up in the morning and there's, there's no worse feeling than waking up. I, I, I get so sad when I see like those, oh, it's Monday memes. I'm like, why, you know? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, that's my dream for everyone, especially that I care about and that I meet that like you wake up in the morning and you're like, great, like it's Monday. I have another week to tackle this problem that I'm like really passionate about. Um, and like I said, there are places out there that you can find to do that. It may not be sitting in your face, um, but if you take some time, you know, as appropriate to like ask some questions and speak to people, there's something out there that will really make you happy and combine your interests. So don't settle for a career that is, that doesn't make you happy if you can't avoid it. Yeah, well, thank you. Let's end on that positive note. And again, thank you for sharing your experience with us and your time. And we look forward to having you back again. Um, and as I mentioned for the students, if you'd like to contact Dr. Nelson, um, please reach out to Sam Anderson if she hasn't already sent you the inf information. So thank you so much. And we will see you all on Wednesday. All right, thank you everyone, bye.